Welcome to the first panel, Modern Technology Applied to Ancient Sources. I'm John Solomon from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I have particular interest in several of these projects, um, but I, you don't need to know about me. You need to uh, hear their papers. Uh, the uh, first paper on the uh, MSG, the Musici Scriptori Scraiti, um, I wrote my dissertation on Cleonides, so this is of particular interest to me. When I wrote my dissertation on Cleonides, needless to say, it was very complicated. I had to order, being in the United States, I had to order from Europe 44 different manuscripts from various libraries, get photo stats, and so on. So I'm really looking forward to this project. So without further ado, Laurent Capron uh, will talk about the project Musici Scriptoris Graeci uh, online. Thank you. I would like to say my gratitude to the organizers of this meeting, Eleonora and Marco, and this for two reasons. First, for let me speak here, and first of first, actually, because they played unknowingly a role in the development of my project. When I received the invitation for this conference, EMSG didn't exist yet except in a part of my mind uh, that I call the would like to do it one day. I just saw there an opportunity to start it, for this project is barely six months old. Therefore, don't expect to see an achieved project. On the contrary, what I intend to show you today is my work in progress, the questions, the problems, the hopes. I will be very grateful of course, to get your remarks, your suggestion, to improve or uh, to solve my problems. I guess that most of you, maybe all of you, know this book. <laughs> I suppose also that many of you have read it, if not read it entirely. But how many have read the preface of it, the 98 pages in Latin? or even know what it is about, or how many authors are inside. Like anybody else, I, fi I fill my book with plenty of notes, and I was thinking that uh, it's about manuscript, about technical terms, about bibliography, and I would also like to indicate other articles and to share my questions with others. So when I started this project, I had that idea in mind to put all my notes in a digitized version, in an organized version, in a way that I could always improve it with additions or emendations. The other wish was to share these informations. Whether they are rough or refined data isn't the problem. They can be useful to others. A digital edition could be like an agora or a forum where people talk, exchange ideas, goods or whatever, with a non-competing mind. That's how it all started. But of course, that was a dream. Very soon, reality woke me up. So let's see how I was able to define my project, what kind of problems I met, and not only the solution I could find or not, but also how my aims have changed during the elaboration of the project. So, um, just to, for, for you to know, I will show you partly a website and partly my slideshow, so be uh, very indulgent in the way it works because I'm not very used to this computer. <laughs> so, first of all, I would like to start with this page. It's uh, the database series, which uh, I created with some colleagues in my team, which is a database about ancient text editions. So, we try to make a repertory of all the ancient text editions, which is a huge work. So some texts are in, like this edition, and you can see that we have made, or I have made, a very detailed uh, bibliography of it. And if you go on any of these uh, links, uh, you can have more details about everything. So you have also a link to um, the website of archive, and you can find our book online. So, the first thing is, 
we know that some texts are online, but not for free. If I go on the TLG website, what I get is that. Which means that this text, the text which is contained in the book, is not really accessible. You have to belong to a library, you have to be part of it, or you have to pay for it. So at the moment, the TLG provides you an access to a semantic-oriented database, but not to a full access text. So you can't work on it. You have to count on a private access, which is a first problem. A, a book which is now 130 years old is not fully accessible. <laughs> the other thing is, as you know, uh, TLG doesn't provide anything else than a text. As I say, it's semantic-oriented database, not exotic oriented database, so you can't work on another way. It's not for manuscript studies, it's just for the content, for the content of the text. And another thing is, as I just said, you know that this book has uh, 90 plus pages of a preface, and it's full of, of information about the manuscript traditions, which you can't use, because it's nowhere. It's absolutely nowhere at the moment. So there is an OCR version of it behind the, the, the images that you can see here online uh, with many, many mistakes. I know it because I had to clean it to put on my website. So I can tell you uh, the OCR version of this text is not usable at the moment because nothing is really well made. It's full of mistakes. It's, uh, nothing is organized. So it's just, it's, it's a rough data. It has to be refined. So at the moment it's still uh, still has to be down. And the other thing is that all the manuscripts which are uh, uh, described in this preface, the something like 140 manuscripts, which is a lot, uh, are all in database pinnacles that you may know, but not with the accuracy that you can find in these uh, descriptions or even in the description of Mattison later on. Many of the manuscripts are still just indicated and there is nothing else. So I don't have the list here, unfortunately, but I was sometimes surprised to see that some manuscripts just have one author saying uh, from that folio to that folio and nothing else. Not even a number to the Madison catalog, nothing to indicate the Yan description, nothing at all. So there is still a lot of work to do on this manuscript tradition. So to do so, to, to find out where I could put my data online, we are lucky in, uh, in France that we have public institution with still some money and still some perennial tools. And in Paris especially, we have uh, a team which has developed a platform for uh, archive online. So it's called, the platform is called Eman. So I will just show you what it is. It's made, so you can go there for free, it's made to, to, uh, to receive and to host all kinds of projects about archive online. So it can be uh, modern text, it can be uh, mathematic archives from Leibniz, for example, it can be, uh, we were the first to put a Greek manuscript, for example, in this, uh, in, in this, on this platform. So it's open to all kinds of projects. It's totally free and it respects all the, the standards of the web at the moment. And there is a team for the maintenance, so we don't have to take care of the team. So if you are like me, the only one on your project, and you can't do everything, you can rely on them, because they will provide you all the environment to just put, to deposit your data, which is kind of a luxury. So about Iman, because I owe them a lot, uh, as I say, it's an editorial system, uh, which is used to produce data analysis. So we have to create the metadata with norms and standards, so they help us for that. There are plenty of forms that you have to fill, and everything answers to Dublin Core, to uh, OAI, PMH, and so on, and so on. It's based, the, the software, the freeware, actually, Omeka. Uh, Omeka is a digital library software, so it's specifically dedicated for libraries. It's free, it's made for corpuses, it's based on web standards, and it's made for humanities. And finally, it respects the FAIR principles. So the FAIR principles, for those who don't know yet, it's uh, FAIR, it's for findable, accessible, 
uh, interoperable and reusable. It means that it's totally open access data. Whatever I put there can be used by anybody else in the same conditions, which means non-commercial, just my name on. Uh, the thing is that we have to remember a digitized, uh, a digital edition is not a digitized edition. Archive.org provide a digitized book. So you have the images of the book. Nothing is treated, all the data are rough. A digital edition has already another level. You have to refine your data, you have to, to explain them, you have to classify, to organize, and to create metadata. So it's a scientific object plus a digital purpose, which is data analysis. So itself, the edition of the book is interesting, but it, it always has the idea that it belongs to an environment. It has to be linked to something else. So in my case, for example, uh, to Pinakes for the manuscript or for other things that I will explain. As I also said, the maintenance made by a dedicated team in Lehman is a very precious tool. Also, what they ask in exchange, because it's free of charge for me, is that I participate to the elaboration of the standards. So if I have special needs, for example, with ancient Greek music here, I will have to develop the tools or to finance the development of new tools for my speci specific needs. So that's a kind of uh, cooperative association. So I will show you at the moment what I have made. It's not a lot, so you will have to be um, very kind with me. Right. So um, at the moment, <coughs> there is not so much yet. You can see all the images I have made. So I made a, a, a new covering of the, all the book uh, based on the exemplar which is hosted in the library of Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, because I couldn't use the, the photos of archive since they come from Google and Google didn't say anything about the conditions of reusing. So if I, if I don't have all these specific conditions written, I can just use their photos. I don't know when they were made, I don't know by whom, I have no specification, so I can't just use them. Sometimes if it's very clear, they say it, it can be reused. Sometimes they don't say anything. So in case of, I did it again totally new. So that's my photos, not the one of Google, which is also a good thing to be free of them. <laughs> so for the time being, I have just treated the preface of the book, nothing else, because it's so much work. I mean, just to make this thing, to organize everything, uh, city by city, so you can see how it's made in this preface. You think it's a whole preface of 96 pages. It's not. It's well divided. It's not written like that. In the book, it just goes one after the other, so you have to, uh, to reorganize. But actually, then you can have a global view of everything. And what I have done until now is the title, the introduction, which is six pages, and the, the manuscript. I mean, all the other texts are inside already, but not treated, not encoded. So I have worked on the V manuscript. Let's see how it looks like. So here you have the photos of uh, the pages concerned, little presentation, and so the folios, localization of the manuscript, and bibliography. And that I will speak about it, because it's not in the book. Here you can see the transcription, and you will see the nice work you have to do with that. So here I put my transcription with my links, and there I have the appearance. The thing is that the source is here, so that's the encoding of all the text, which is um, not so difficult at the end. It looks barbarian, but it's not me, so everybody can do it. Um, so. There is one point at the moment, and that's a main concern. I made some links, as you can see here, to, uh, to, other manu to, uh, to external uh, references, but there is a bug in the system that has not been solved yet by the maintenance team. So if I click on the, on the link, I just open the same page, which is problematic. Mm. So uh, for the time being, I have to go there to right click, to copy that. Ah. It doesn't work 
well to the country. So what is made of uh, 50 watts? If you go to Synacus, I just show you here it is. So here you have the bibliography. You will notice that Yan is not in the bibliography. So it's totally absent. There is a catalog of Matisse, but nothing else. And then we have the description of the manuscript. This one is well made. It's, uh, it's a proper one. So the idea is to link, uh, where was I here? Is to link the data or the data of, the, of the, the, the text to external data. So I did that also with, um, uh, with names of, uh, of people, for example, in the introduction it's about Mayborn, so then you can make a link to, uh, let's say, the wiki page of, uh, of Mayborn, for example, it's a personal name, you can do that with place names as well. Here I have find out also all the bibliography, so for example, when it's written, uh, Friedrich Bellermann, Kul Rimnos, Mesomedis Rikenseret, you have to find out to which books it refers, because there is no, no not for them. So there was a very long work to identify all the references of every uh, single bibliographical uh, data in this uh, introduction. <laughs> and uh, well, there is less and less step by step, but still. Uh, I had a problem some days ago, this thing, it was non-identified because Satas has written huge books. And in between I found out the reference. I know where it is, but um, because somebody else has discovered it, so. Uh, I think it's uh, El Bibliomioni in his uh, uh, catalog of uh, manuscript. He has found out the, the reference, so I can uh, steal it. <laughs> but you see, it's quite difficult. <coughs> and then you have all these people, like Victorio, Victorio Lundfeldtrensen, you don't know who, it, who he is, me neither. So you go there, and then you discover on Bibissima, there is a whole thing about him, and more data, and so on, and so on. So that's the enrichment of this data. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you could see that I have the first page, all the, um, well, uh, the bibliography is stored in um, a Zotero uh, uh, library, a public library. So if you go on, uh, I would like to find it here. So that's all my items, yeah, here. And I could link um, my page to uh, a Zotero library, and I just make the library, I link the library to my website, and then I just tag my books. So for example, all the books that I have tagged with MSV will appear in the web page of uh, Manuscript V. So that's how I get the whole list at the beginning. It's automatic then. That, that's a good thing with Zotero, you can tag anything, you can tag 200 times the same book, it will appear 200 times, so it's very practical to use that way. And Zotero is free of charge, everybody can use it, everybody can connect to the, to the public library, so it's, uh, it's a very simple system. And finally, the other thing I wanted to, uh, to show you is uh, a little thing I start to develop, but it's uh, just a beginning, so that's a fake thing I will show you at the moment, because it's mainly for, for the text, not for the preface, but you can make an index of terms. And my idea was that finally we could make um, a lexicon of technical musical terms. But for that, um, well, the definition proposed by Jan, for example, or the definition proposed by somebody else later on, won't be the same because science has made some, some improvements. So what I wanted is that step by step we could add all the knowledge about one specific term and all the references to that term. So if you go, for example, on Sympleco, you arrive on, slowly, yeah. So I just put fake uh, uh, bibliography here, doesn't matter. And here I have the place where the word appears. So here, Sympleplectai. So if I find more uh, uh, occurrences of the word, they will make a whole list of all the occurrences. And I can add several level of uh, data about the words, like for example categories, if it's a rhythmical uh, word, if it's an instrumental uh, word, or, or whatever. So you can detail in categories your vocabulary, and then you can classify it. So it can be very useful. 
And the thing is, once you, you have that, uh, you can edit it, and because here you see nothing, I did nothing on this term. But if, if you edit the term, then you can, so uh, for example here I put a tag, and you can give a definition of the term here, you can add more uh, bibliographical data, you can do a lot of things, you can say who, I say what, in uh, which footnote, for example, and, and so on. So it can be a huge definition. But at least at the end, you will have a real lexicon of uh, musical specific terms. And you can link the, the words together, so there are plenty of possibilities for, for this lexicon. So that's all the, the dream. Of course, you see, it's uh, well, a dream. Now, what are my problems? Because there are many. Uh, the first one is the amount of work. I have to, to define slices to make all this work in a progressive line. So, uh, for example, at the moment, I just work on the preface. That's my purpose for the next year. I also divided the preface in many slices. So I make the big manuscript first, then I will make all the little cities because they have different problems. And every time for encoding, I will also do the thing step by step. So first, I prepare my things, and then I will say, okay, today I will make only the bibliography. Then I will find all the personal names, and so on, and so on. Otherwise, you, you will never see the end, because you start, and you say, oh yeah, and this I have to encode, and this I have to encode, and you never arrive at the end. So a good project has to be achieved. And the idea is, okay, you do slice by slice, level by level, layer by layer, and once a layer is finished, you can say, I did it. It can be public now. If I want to do another layer later on, it's not a problem. I will do it later. So it's all about yeah, uh, managing the, the timeline. Now what are the limits of the project? Um, as I already said, um, we have in this preface something like 120 plus manuscripts. We know more manuscripts nowadays. So what do we do with the additive knowledge we have since 1895? We have more bibliographical data, we have more recent editions of text, so why would I put online something which is so old? So, first of all, because it's part of the history of science. I mean, it's a big step in the knowledge of uh, ancient theory, uh, theory. But also, I can use in this platform some extra pages dedicated to new things it's called a virtual exhibition, so it can be ab uh, about something else. So, for example, a manuscript which has some uh, interest, special interest, because it has been discovered lately, uh, can be part of it. So it will be linked, but it will be integrated, but it will be a side. It will be all this environment I was talking about. It's not in the book, it's around the book. It's after the book. It can be the same, for example, about some people who have played an important role in the tradition. For example, this Francesco Barbaro, who was a famous owner of manuscripts, and uh, his library has been widespread among different libraries. So it's important to know how the, how the manuscripts have gone in different libraries. So this Francesco Barbaro belonged to a family which had some importance, so you, you, you may want to, to trace. So uh, everything can be made extra. Um, and then, uh, there is another problem. Another problem which is about the science. So, musical science. We have a problem nowadays. Jan has tried to solve a problem with the oddity of science. So he has created typographical things to solve the problem. But I am on the second level. I have to encode the oddities of Jan to solve the oddities of the manuscript. <laughs> It's endless. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem that I have to solve. I have to find a solution. Maybe it would just be, I would just forget it for a moment until I have a solution. It's, um, yeah, it's really uh, a concern. All the problems are, I have to get adapted to the platform Eman, which has some uh, obligations, like the TEI system they use, the TEI scheme they use is extremely simple because it has to, uh, to, f uh, to fit with all the projects. So I have few tags to encode my, uh, my text. So sometimes I need yeah, something more, so that it's also discussions with, uh, with the team. How do we improve that without destroying the whole balance of the structure of the, of the platform? 
And, um, and there is also one thing, uh, Eman is based on the manifesto, uh, which contains an ethical uh, part. And that's why I also chose this platform. Uh, Eman is supposed to uh, provide free access data to everybody, but to everybody in the way they are, including people with disabilities. And I have a problem. I mean, nowadays it's possible to make a synthetic uh, voice to read Latin or ancient Greek. That's not the point. But how do I read things which are not pronounceable like these signs? So that's something I would like to find out, and that's one of my aims, to find a solution to express these signs that we can uh, hear if you play them, but not if you read them. So it's, it's another problem, because only the name of the sign is another problem. It, you can't just say the name of the sign. So I have to, to find out these kind of things, because it would be really fitting with the, with the ideal of, uh, of the database. So uh, the solutions, yeah, uh, they will come step by step, we will see. Uh, so I go directly to my conclusions now. <laughs> In that short presentation, too short presentation, I have tried to show the, uh, the interest of the EMSG project, I hope so, but also its limits and the problems that I have to realize it. But there are some solutions, some will, which, uh, which will need few efforts, some will need more. And I'm totally aware that as soon as I will go further in my work, I will find more problems. So let us be a little bit enthusiastic and ambitious for a moment. EMSG, EMSG is more than a digitized book. It's a digital edition with data enrichment and all kind of metadata that can be analyzed. And I hope that soon I will find contributors to help me in this Herculanean work, or for encoding or for implementing the lexicon or to create more virtual exhibitions. But the real aim of EMSG is to be a foundation stone, a foundation stone for a patrimonial digital library. What do I mean? Ancient Greek music covers a lot of aspects, theory, partitions, philosophy, archeology, span performance history, etc. At the end, it's a rather large field where all the sources have to be reconnected. By exploring the uh, possibilities and the limits of one single digital edition, which presents many questions, many problems, and by choosing a platform of edition whose policies are complete open access, the respect of web standards, interoperability, long-term maintenance, I want to place digital projects in ancient Greek music in a wider world so that it's not contained in a specific and isolated environment. I'm not blind or naive about the difficulties that will uh, be encountered to standardize text, images, and sounds, or printed editions, inscriptions, and manuscripts. But I'm sure that there, we have a lot to explore. I only wish that EMSG project will help us to start this movement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, ancient Greek musical sources, and to make this, uh, to introduce it, uh, the first article I ever published was on the Vienna Orestes Papyrus, uh, which I looked at photographs, this is in the 1970s, and uh, discovered a note that had been overlooked before. I published this, and uh, for the first Moisa meeting right here in this room, I met Egert Perlman for the first time, and he said, oh, you know, that was a piece of dirt. <laughs> so uh, I looked at a photograph that looked like there was another line on it, but it was a piece of dirt. So anyway, uh, so I'm in quite interested in hearing about reevaluation of the sources from Christos Tertzis of the Austrian Academy, Ancient Greek Musical Scores, a documented reevaluation of the sources. Christos. Thank you. Dear Eleonora, members of the organizing committee of the 14th Moisa Conference here in Cremona, please accept my congratulations for the exceptional organization of this meeting and my gratitude for letting me be together with all the present members of our society. 
My presentation is partly related to modern technology towards a coherent understanding of the music of the past and, of course, completely tied to the project diagram implemented at the Austrian Archaeological Institute by Stefan Heigel and myself towards a new digital edition of the ancient musical documents. It comprises two parts. In the first part, I briefly describe the web view of our edition. All credits are attributed to Stefan who has designed and developed both the editing and web view interface. In the second part, I'll argue on a novel hypothesis in identifying the pitch value of two particular note signs, evidences in the sources, but missing from any available treatises that raise issues related to musical notation. The proposed hypothesis, unfortunately, cannot be verified, but it appears consistent with particular bits of evidence about pitches identified as not belonging to the harmonic structure of the notation system. A supplement will follow, providing a coherent rhythmical pattern compatible with the evidence transmitted in the last instrumental interlude of the Berlin Papyrus. Last year in Strasbourg, I presented the methodological aspects of the diagram endeavor outlining the internal structure through which each document within the Greek musical corpus is transmitted in the computer language as a separate XML file, allowing the interoperability in accessing data within the core of a precisely defined syllable notated by musical and rhythmical signs. Thus, a series of such syllabic elements convey our new readings of the sources and those of the previous editors, building a conceptually structured musical document that appears neatly transformed in the XML. This file is ultimately employed by the interface through which the end user is allowed to assess the document's edition via the web. Let me present this interface. Each page is assigned to a particular musical document. The header informs the visitor about the document's title, source, and dating. In the main frame of the page, our edition appears by default. Each line comprises two distinct layers, the text and the music above it. By clicking on each of the editors to the right upper frame, the visitor enables the readings of the respective editor. Readings regularly accompanied by particular critical symbols, such as the scribal deletion or correction, the editorial supplement, exempli gratia supplement, and doubtful reading, are here exemplified by the respective coloring of the part of the text or notation to which those symbols apply. The relevant color key appears, uh, appears in a distinctive frame below that of the editors. Black rectangular blocks in the notation layer distinguish the difference between black and damaged surfaces in the source. By navigating throughout the edition, a specific part of the source's image appears tagged on its respective syllabic element. And by clicking on it, the entire image emerges, allowing the visitors to inspect the readings of the whole surviving fragment by themselves. An advanced player module enables the auditorial materialization of the melodic line in customizable tempo tuning and sound timbre. Below the editor's frame, two apparatus critics are available, one for the notation and a second for the text. The visitor is allowed to switch manually from a negative to a positive apparatus, both exemplifying the deviations among the readings offered by the editors. The following tape transcription, accompanied by the lyrics in Greek and Latin transliteration, allows visitors acquainted with modern musical notation to monitor the sequence of the pitches and time values in their respective keys and rhythmical sections. At the same time, the melodic and rhythmical lines referencing to the notated text are provided in tablature to those unfamiliar with sheet music. Thus, the visitor can follow the species and the magnitudes of the musical intervals involved in each document, as well as the sequences of their relative durations. Moreover, the pitches evidenced in each document appear arranged in their tonal positions on the Greek notation system, allowing the visitor to inspect the possible tonoi and the genera on which the document is composed, to exclude, to exclude unacceptable options and detect potential modulations within the harmonic system. 
In the following commentary, a discussion is provided on the new readings offered in the framework of our research, with a particular focus on musical and rhythmical issues raised in cases of discrepancies or inconsistencies detected in the documentation presented by the previous editors. Our new readings are ensured either in, on the in situ inspections under the microscope of the sources, other premises in which papyri are kept, or on high quality digital color images that have been sent to us. A list of the selected bibliography is followed by three buttons, providing apart from a printable and XML, and XML version of the document's music sheet, the possibility of the complete document's XML export, bestowing the user to exploit the structurally organized textual, musical, and rhythmical data. Let me now focus on discussing some of the documents, starting from the collection of the musical papyri kept in the Papyrus Museum in Vienna. The collection comprises nine papyrus fragments, including the renowned Orestes fragment, fragment, allegedly transmitting original Euripidean music. The rest have been edited by Hunger and Pellman, who reveals that they convey tragic ex excerpts. They have all derived from the same cartonage. The fragments are dated around 200 BC, and concerning their notation, they share the characteristics we meet in the early musical documents. Pitches follow the word accent, while likely deviations imply strophic composition. The note signs are usually accommodated above the first or in the space between the first and the second letter of the corresponding syllabic unit. They carry simple rhythmical notation comprising only the dicem or tricem bars denoting their duration and dots signifying the weak part of the rhythmical pattern. Repeated notes in succeeding syllables are not notated. Melismas in long syllables are accompanied by the repetition of the vowel within the respective syllable, and sporadically, instrumental notes appear interfering between the vocal ones aligned to the text, usually but not exclusively preceded by the sign of the di diastole. In general, the rhythm attends to the meter of the notation text. Last year, in our meeting, I focused on the notation of the Orestes fragment, and I argued, among other issues, on the uncertainty of the note zeta at the beginning of the second line of the fragment, as well as the emendation of the first note in line five from phi to the reversed alpha. Let me now proceed to the document number nine. It consists of two papyrus fragments, A and B, and Hunger proved that both were physically very close to each other on the grounds of their identical fiber setup. The lower part of A matches the upper part of B if the latter is placed to the right side of the former. Sufficiently ex uh, extended surviving portions of the text in lines five to eight show that the meter is compatible with the anapestic and dactylic arrangement, fitting nicely to tragic lyrics. The fragment's form is divided into two parts by means of a pretentious hill-like sign aligned to the text layer in line six, topped by the word frigisti. This is the reading offered by the previous editors in the notation layer. The hill-like sign has been identified as a diastole by Kanicht and the indication Phrygisti is supposed to announce a tonus shift to the Phrygian. However, the musical note defining the Phrygian character is eta, H, appearing in the section between the so-called diastole. Indeed, the preserved notation of the first part is compatible with the higher range of the hypophrygian. It comprises, apart from its messy, notes within the diezermenon and chromatic hyperboleon tetrachords, while in the second part, after the he-like sign, even though the chromatic note eta does not appear anymore, the surviving notes suggest either a shift to the Lydian or a stay in the hypophrygian, given that both tonoi share the sigma, rho, mi, iota tetrachords. 
The potential interpretation that the Frigisti of the old Harmonia is meant among those delivered by Aristides in the Lydian notation must also be excluded due, due to the repeated use of the note mi, which is incompatible with the Phrygian harmonia. Closer inspection of the indication reads as frigisti allow us to suggest that a correction at the end of the reading to Phrygia followed by a series of two or three unreadable letters. Not improbably, the he-like sign combined with Phrygia can plausibly announce a provincial shift of the action to Phrygia, introduced by a musical section performed by the chorus that is Horu out of the he. Under this interpretation, the indication Phrygia denotes the provincial scenic change. Of course, the preserved notes are not enough to establish, to establish a change to the Lydian tonos, and a possible modulation of this short would contradict the Phrygian scenic background. Of particular interest, we consider the appearance of a not la sign lying in the last line of the fragment. Its form comprises a gamma-like shape, and the bottom end of which is joined, by, uh, is joined to a horizontal line bent upwards like an arc and ending up mm -hmm. with a bachelor-like diagonal. The same shine reappears in the second line of the document 13 in a more elegant style comprising a top horizontal joined to an almost headless zeta. Pelman West identified it is as an incomplete vita, B. Indeed, it comes up by reverting and subsequently by turning the incomplete B by 90 degrees counterclockwise. However, an almost confident regular incomplete B can be detected in the fifth line of the document 15, a papyrus fragment belonging to the collection of the Vienna musical papyri, all deriving from the same cartonage. Consequently, it is, hardly it is hardly possible for the same note sign to exhibit its standard form and its idiosyncratic version within a group of sources of similar dating and pro province. Undoubtedly, it conveys a pitch value, even though the available evidence that does not allow for a verified identification. The possibility of a cursively shaped P should be excluded on paleographic grounds. It appears twice in the Vienna musical papyri collection in the Hypophrygian or the Lydian harmonic context, followed both times by, by the hipati like sigma. At the same time, its setting must be irrelevant to its time value and the word accent, since it appears lying both above an unaccented short syllable, trocala in this document, and above an accented long one, angisi, in the document 13, line two. Before proceeding to a possible approach towards interpreting the sign in question in terms of pitch, I'd like to describe an interesting case followed in two musical documents dated in the Roman era, the tragic excerpts transmitted in the Old Slow and the Berlin papyri fragments. The melody moves in the Ionian tonos in the Oslo papyrus, exhibiting modulations to the nearest hypo and hyper scales. Unexpectedly, in lines six and seven, the note lambda appears, a functionally paripati-like note sign corresponding to the Dorian scale. Its pitch is in the Dorian tonos is equivalent to that of the hipati-like kappa in the Hyastian if the semitonal structure of the notation system is considered. However, it is rather impossible to be digested that the composer exchanged the dominant Ionian messy of the scale in which the melody moves by a note sign functionally movable assigned to the same pitch and belonging to the Dorian, far away from the Yastian. Literally, one may object that in the enharmonic genre, lambda lies exactly a quarter ton, ton below kappa. Thus, Indeed, it is not improbable that the composer intentionally introduced a pitch lying less than a semitone below the paramesi, kappa, maintaining at the same time the Ionian character of his scale. 
the scale step in question is missing in the Ionian, and it appears to be the, com the composer's deliberate intention to make use of this quarter tone interval. The selection of the func functionally paripati-like Dorian lambda, on the other hand, hand, denotes the temporary and accidental nature of the introduced note, maintaining, on the other, the character of the music section. Constituting the above mentioned musical phenomenon to a general convention that integrates the notation system would be summarized as follows. The sign for accidental that stands, that stands a quarter tone below paramesi in a certain tonus A is that of the treaty of the disjunctive tetrachord, tetrachord belonging to the tonus that lies a semitone lower than tonus A does. A parallel of this case can be observed in the last notated document of the Berlin Papyrus, of which unfortunately only one line is preserved. Here, the accidental that, lie, that lies a semitone below paramesi, or a quarter tone below paramesi tough in the hypolydian has been drawn from the hypodorian scales treated as f menon, the hypsilon. The convention in introduced above, however, and unfortunately, cannot be applied universally. The central keys from the Phrygian up to the hypolydian offer the sign of their paramesi to the treaty DSF menon of the tonos lying a semitone above them. Consequently, if an accidental note that stands a quarter tone below, below paramesi is needed when the melody moves in one of these four tonoi, the introduction of four new signs appears necessary. Coming back to the musical document number nine, if the incidence mentioned above fits the case here, it is not improbable that the characteristic sign in line nine has been introduced to function as an accidental in the hypophrygian, studying about a quarter tone step below the hypophrygian paramesi sigma. <coughs> Within the same context, I will try an identification of the check-like sign appearing in three fragments of the Oxenicus papa music papyri. It interferes in the Lydian context, and it will be identified as a pitch lying a quarter tone below the Lydian paramesi zeta. On balance, our musical corpus perhaps preserves two out of the four signs especially introduced to define a pitch standing a quarter tone below paramesi, those in the Lydian and the hypophrygian tonoi. Of course, the hypothesis presented above cannot be verified by the sources. However, given the fact that our perception of the, mus of the ancient music remains delimited due to the incomplete available evidence, suggested hypotheses must be deemed, especially as regards flecks of evidence that remain obscure. The presented table shows that the introduced signs not fitting the structure of the notation system are influenced, influenced by their neighboring note signs as suggested. The one related to the hypophrygian lying below the paramesi of the respective tonos resembles the sign of paramesi, and its right end towards the bottom level of the line may imply that it stands lower than sigma. Respectively, in Lydian, the check-like sign may have been influenced by the Lydian messi and its right end towards the top level may indicate that it stands three quarter tones above the Lydian mess. A similar but not the same case is detected in the second lyric fragment of the Berlin Papyrus. This one at, and its addendum at the end of the papyrus sheet, despite the date late of the papyrus in the second century CE, are allegedly carriers of early lyric verses. For this reason, they have been listed among the musical fragments of the late classical to the early Hellenistic period in the Dagon Corpus. The music, however, must have been of a late day, date. Interestingly, even though it moves in the highest register of the hyperaeolian from paraniti of the disjunctives up to the niti of the hyperbole, the paraniti hyperbolean zeta has been replaced by epsilon a pitch standing higher than zeta. 
it has been argued that in reference to the nitty hyperboleon, the introduction of Vita observes the quarter tone degrees as regards the early music employing quarter tones. From such a point of view, the selection of epsilon appears obscure and promotes the argument that epsilon stands three quarter tones below alpha. Nevertheless, this argument would hold water if both zeta and alpha were utilized as steps of the scale. Contrarily, here, zeta is entirely missing and has been replaced by epsilon, which according to the rules of notation, stands a semitone above the zeta, a member of the first column of the notation triads. By introducing epsilon in substituting zeta, the composer violates the regular tetrachotic structure, contaminating the Aristoxenian doctrine of melodic composition. The pentatonic scale constituted by a tonus, semitone, trihemitone, semitone succession remains completely unattested in the earlier classical or Hellenistic documents. On the other hand, this particular semitonal shift of the diatonic paranity maximizes the impact of Tecmesa's lament about Ayas's suicide, functioning as a performing tool. It is not improbable that concerning the position of the trihemitone in the chromatic, a release from bondage to the Haristoxenian theory originated as early as the Roman era. Interestingly, chromatic tetrachords comprising the semitone, trihemitone, semitone succession are widely used in the lamenting hymns of the Byzantine chant and the Greek folk songs mourning the sudden and ineluctable life loss and the unutterable consequences of war. The meter of the text has been identified as dactylo epitric by scholars. The ends of the decola appear prolonged in the course of the regularization of the rhythm by a short time value. West, followed by Perlman, has considered the first syllable of ion in the second light of the fragment extended by a long time beat. However, this assumption cannot be corroborated by the preserved rhythmical notation. The long first syllable is notated by a dicolon, two note signs, and a pair comprising the lima tied to one note sign by a hyphen. To my interpretation, the first two notes are divided into two short time values, while the hyphenated pair cannot exceed one time beat given that it lacks the Dyson bar above it. Consequently, the D colon ending is repeated consistently both at K in line one and at the first syllable of Ayas in line two. My last stop today deals with the instrumental piece extending in three lines following Tecmisa's lament in the Berlin Papyrus. The interlude is notated in the diatonic genre of the hyperionic, extending from proslavanomenos up to the paraniti desef menon and covering the pitch rates of an octave plus four. The rhythmical notation involves the entire series of evidenced rhythmical signs, including the diesem bar, the acid dot, the hyphen, and the dicolon. The combismo sign, interpreted as a staccato repetition within a short time value, appears also. The acid dots have been consistently placed above the corresponding signs, allowing a detailed identification of the constituted rhythmical pattern. According to the interpretation offered by Perlman West, each rhythmical period comprises three pionic patterns constituting the 2-3, 3-2, 3-2 rhythmical scheme. The periods are repeated, are repeated constantly up to the end of the interlude. The acid dots top the second sign of the dicems and the last or the two final signs of the dicem patterns. Se specifically, the lines comprise the succession presented in the slide. Surprisingly, the lima before the papyrus break at the end of line three lacks its expected dot, although it supposedly is supposedly to to belongs to the second part of a pattern identified it as a Dyson, but it may be due to a scribal omission. As it can be inferred, a sequence of three pionic patterns of the above scheme entails 
that two pairs of diceme patterns are followed by two pairs of trisomes before a singular two to three transition. Given that the length of each line does not provide a complete sequence of seven successive rhythmical patterns, the only way to verify the rhythmical period as suggested above should assure that the presence of a three beat pattern preceded by the three two three rhythmical scheme is impossible. Close observation in line two reveals, however, that the three two three three sequence is violating the suggested rhythmical pattern. To my interpretation, the rhythmical period of this interlude is compatible only with a 16-bit pattern comprising the 233-233 repeated sequence. The first line preserves two out of the three beats of the last trisem. The second line stands from the first meter second trisem and ends at the first note of the sequence. Finally, the third line sets out at the first beat of the second meter and ends at the second beat of the second meter's first tricep. If the original column's width is considered, the whole interlude comprises four complete periods, each consisting of 16 beats. Thank you for your attention. While we're switching technologies, we have time for a question or two. Yes, we have time for a book over there. Okay. Thank you, Barnaby. Uh, as regards the, no the word note, I tried, I think, most of the times to use the note sign, meaning the notation sign used for a certain pitch. But of course, you're right about the note value, the pitch value. It's not. I, I would just call those signs pitches. Okay, thank not you. Notes. Two 
Yeah, that, that's the idea. I mean, I will do the lexicon anyway for my, uh, for my project because I want to, um, to tag all the technical yeah. terms. But of course, if it can be linked to external resources, I'm glad of that. Because that's the idea that you can link resources and that people from one world can go further can go, yeah. somewhere we, we else. Can, if it's already can, made, yeah. very good. That's, yeah, yeah, that yeah. I don't have to I, do. I to yeah, but that, that's very good. Yeah, but that's yeah. just the idea of it. It's just yeah. um, we, we have to create a standard so that we can exchange the data. That's the only thing. Yeah. So that's how we have to work together, but we speak about the same term, and, and then it's easy to, to make a link. Yeah. So that, that's okay. very good to know. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we, uh, we're appropriate for a panel on modern technology applied to ancient sources. We're going to change the technology that we're using to deliver the change in technology. So uh, without further ado, um, Claudina Romero Mayorga from the Ur Museum at Reading is going to talk about reintroducing music making and dancing in music collections, the use of 3D printed replicas. Please. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks very much for accepting my proposal. Um, of course, I wish I could be there with you. Uh, but let's be thankful uh, to technology for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, so I hope you all can see my shared screen. And um, I'm going to start a bit like a TV show previously. Uh, Saloniki in 2019, um, we introduced our project Cyprus in 3D, uh, which showed a selection of our collection of Cypriot origin and how we used them uh, as three modeled and 3D printed replicas um, to show their potential and their usefulness as um, educational and research tools. So, um, for those of you who uh, were not part of this, uh, of, of this meeting, uh, so Cyprus in 3D is part of a project by the Yule Museum. The Yule Museum is part of the Department of Classics at the University of Reading. And um, we have a holding, I think we have like 100 uh, objects of Cypriot origin. Uh, but we decided to focus on these Kamalaga figurines to experiment uh, with 3D printing. Um, so, as you can see, these are uh, figurines that are around uh, archaic to classic uh, period. They all come from Kitun, or at least we think we, they have, because um, the only information that we have is that they come from old tombs. Uh, but because of, you know, comparison and parallelisms, uh, you will find that they are very similar to those uh, displayed, for example, at the Ashmolean, and they are, we know, from Kamalaga uh, Shrine. They are of mixed technique, uh, which means they have a molded face, they have a well-made body and handmade uh, arms. They usually uh, are holding an object, uh, possibly an offering to the gods. Uh, the three last figurines that you can see at the bottom, they are entirely uh, more made. And uh, most scholars uh, from Kara Georgis, who, who has made, well, who made lots of catalogues from all over the island of Cyprus, um, classifying these figurines, especially uh, the ones from the archaic period. Um, research suggests that they are uh, votives that they were offered to the gods to ensure uh, good crops and um, of course uh, they are uh, votives but we wanted to know more about them and we wanted to check uh, about the symbolism and further functions that they could have uh, displayed. Um, so we started with photogrammetry, we used to have a 3D scanner, uh, but there was a, a student-led project, I think it was led by James Lloyd over there, um, and again that project uh, was based on the usefulness of virtual models in teaching, and they were all uploaded uh, onto Sketchfab, 
Um, so we wanted to know more about these figurines and instead of starting photogrammetry with other objects, uh, we just, you know, for the sake of uh, being such a time-consuming process, uh, we started with those that we already had uh, the 3D models online. Uh, when it came to experimenting uh, with 3D printing, we used two printers. One, uh, well, I think both were donated by the Friends of Museums and other uh, associations. And the whole uh, point of experimenting printing them was to, you know, first of all, learn how to use their 3D printers and also to experiment with different textures and different scales and different colors. And you see the, the, the technical specs. Um, but the idea that we wanted to convey here uh, was, you know, the, the idea of multiplicity, of different scales, um, of probably different layers of symbolisms. And we all had in our minds uh, the, the finds in Ayairini, mostly displayed in the Middle Half Museum. And um, so, as you can see here, we have many replicas of these two models and um, some of them were painted, some of them were added some sort of base because they were fragmented and um, we also, uh, you know, try to mirror uh, the position of the different objects just to convey an idea of, of movement. Um, I think we ended up having around 30 replicas of these figurines. And this whole Cyprus in 3D project was at first, you know, uh, devised to see how they could be used in an educational environment in a museum. So uh, we decided to host a series of activities uh, with different audiences from primary kids to retired people or, you know, from eight years old to 60 years old. So, you know, it was a broad audience and we gave them that you see like an activity sheet with some, uh, some questions and we asked them, you know, to move around the, the replicas and we asked them, what do you think the figurines look like? Uh, what do you think they might represent? What genders they might reflect? What, what sort of objects are they conveying? And uh, how do you think they were found? And we found this one especially interesting because, of course, it reminded us of the ring dancers or the ring musicians um, that we know were very present in Cypriot iconography. So, in the end, we uh, assessed the, the analysis and, and the data uh, from this feedback and we realized that many people were very interested in music, in music in antiquity especially because the object that was uh, supposed to be held by one of the figurines was a tambourine or, or was identified as a tambourine. And you can see here that we have many tambourine players uh, at the Yule Museum and you also can see the different types of tambourine replicas that we came to make, uh, one of them with very low resolution and um, some of them still display the concretions attached to the uh, to the terracotta. Some of them have the base. You know, you could really tell that you know those bases uh, have been uh, done on purpose uh, because it was impossible to uh, to stand for themselves because the base was broken off. But we also uh, made some molds, so uh, you know, children or visitors could just push some air drying clay and get back home with some reproductions, some replicas of their own figurines. And so, you know, the, the analysis and the relationship the object uh, could be extended. Why was it so important to us uh, to come up with this extra handling collection? Because we rely on object-based teaching pedagogies and we think that by interacting directly with the object, uh, you learn much more than just by visualizing it inside the case. And uh, although at the Yule Museum we have a, a handling collection of genuine artifacts, 
um, it's, you know, these Cypriot terracottas are very heavy on one hand and very fragile on the other. Um, so we didn't want to take them out of the cases. That's why we experimented with these uh, 3D replicas. But as I was saying, most of our audience, um, you know, uh, agreed with a scholarship and, and said that these were musicians. So we decided to delve into the uh, archaic Cypriot soundscape. Uh, so for that, we were inspired by the work of Professor uh, John C. Franklin, Kinira's The Divine Liar. And you can see many examples here of a widely disseminated iconography of the tambourine players on different media. And uh, we learned a lot from this. And uh, we also saw that along with tambourine players, we had a lyre player. We decided to create our own lyre player. And the thing is that we didn't have a lyre player in our collection, but we saw that in many other museums they had this sort of musician, so with the um, Hellenic lyre, the one that it looks like symmetric, and then the other one, the Near Eastern lyre, the asymmetric. Um, so by using an uh, Autodesk mesh mixer, which is a very, very intuitive uh, software, and I can say it's very easy because I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not a designer, and I was able to use it uh, with a lot of help and many tutorials, but I got there. Um, so we created a lyre and we sort of inserted it into the place where the tambourine originally was. And this was a great idea because if you think about the position of the arms in this figurine, match those uh, that are usually playing the lyre. So here you have the votives uh, playing the lyre. And of course we used uh, a bit of acrylic paint to convey the idea of clay, of terracotta. So, you know, it wasn't just a, a way of handling them, it was a way of uh, conveying the meaning of the material. Of course, materiality issues are always there with 3D printing replicas. It's not the same holding a terracotta object than holding uh, a plastic one. In the end, people feel more comfortable with them because they don't feel afraid of dropping. So that's, you know, a, a positive side. Um, so with this uh, replicas, we, uh, we, you know, we saw how our audience were playing with them, were moving them around. And we decided to create uh, certain stop motion animations to encourage the use of motion uh, in these terracottas because we think that, you know, they're handmade, they're very tactile. Um, they were supposed to be moved around either, you know, in the sanctuary, being deposited, being put in another place or being moved to a, a, a sort of favisa or whatever you want to, to call it, a ritual deposition. Um, so, they, you know, our audience was still very much interested in, in music and um, we decided to create, you know, like a tiny orchestra here. And we used uh, as a background photographs of ancient Cypriot sanctuaries. So one of the first um, interaction among these figurines, these replicas, were a sort of, you know, dancing uh, among the, the warrior and the musician. And even if they didn't know this, but they were covering the, the old trope of the hero, the warrior, being also, you know, a musician just like Achilles. So we were very happy with that idea. Then we have the circular procession, and again, this is some sort of circulation that is reminding us of those ring dancers that I, I told you about just a minute ago. And finally, some sort of dancing as, you know, part of nonverbal language and nonverbal messages devoted to the gods or, you know, some sort of ritual uh, that was taking place in the uh, Cypriot community uh, to, to convey a message, you know, to their peers or their gods or... 
At that meeting, uh, Professor, Pla uh, Professor Franklin and also uh, Julia Irons were very happy with our, uh, with our replica, so this was like the highest point for us in that case. It was really great. And that since July 2019, we've been really busy, so this is what we've been doing. We continue doing photogrammetry to uh, other tambourine players in this case. Uh, it's one of those prototypes that are entirely uh, made out, uh, in a mold. Um, it was very easy to, you know, photograph, and the 3D printing replica didn't require much extra support because, as you can see, it's very well preserved, and the, the shape of the figurine uh, allows you to, to, you know, just print it without, without tree support or, or any other things. But we wanted to uh, complete our orchestra uh, with an Aulus player. And again, we didn't have an Aulus player, and we know the Aulus player is the least common musician prototype in archaic Cyprus. I think the record says that we have around uh, 115 tambourine players. We have 89 uh, lyre players and I think it's around 20 Aulus player. And I don't know if it's because, you know, in the end, representations of Aulus are much more fragile than tambourines or lyres. Um, so we weren't for it. But there was this issue. It was the position of the arms. You've just seen how easily it was to attach the lyre to the tambourine player because of the position of the arms. It wasn't the case with the Aulus player. So we did photogrammetry on another figurine. In this case, uh, the, uh, the, the attribute here, the object is lost, but because it has the, the arms parallel to, uh, to the body, we decided that this could be like a good idea for our Aulus player. So we chopped the bit of the arms uh, there and we, added to the original figurine that we, we've been already working with uh, for s such a long time. So here is a mesh of our Aulus player. Here are two prototypes uh, with different uh, pipes shaped in slightly different ways because of the other prototypes we saw in other collections. Here we have the fourth beetle and um, uh, he is not painted yet, uh, but you know this came uh, as a great way to continue delving into the presence of music in archaic Cyprus and especially in our collections. The Your Museum has a long tradition of researching uh, music in antiquity. You would remember there was a Moisa meeting. James already led uh, an exhibit there, so uh, there's not much to say regarding that except for the, you know, um, the inclusion of movement. If we want to use all our senses, if we are promoting uh, a, sense, a sensorial approach to archaeology and to our collection, we have to remember that, you know, motion was there, it's just that now it's lost, it was ephemeral. So, uh, based again on Franklin's uh, publication and these amazing uh, drawings of the uh, Cyprophoenician Phialai that were recovered all over the Mediterranean. We wanted to, you know, delve into the uh, presence of motion and processions and offerings. So we try to place the three musicians in the same environment and um, you saw the mesh, it's very, uh, very regular one, it has nothing uh, special about it. So we covered them in a sort of terracotta colour. I know that we still have remains of polychromy, it's just that, you know, for the sake of coming up with some sort of animation, it was easier for us to make. Uh, but we didn't have like an archaic goddess in our collection, so we borrowed one, uh, a Cypro um, Phoenician, if you want, it's more Phoenician than Cypro, um, gorgeous in, in a Spanish collection. And so 
Thanks to Sketchfab, we were able to download it free of charge. And we came with this idea of musicians um, offering their own music to the goddess or uh, highlighting the presence of divinity by uh, you know, the company of music. The animation is in very early stages, but so that you can have an idea, this is a very basic uh, animation, but we're getting there. We, we are trying to, you know, continue to pile on the idea of motion and how, you know, an ecstatic display of this object is not entirely correct from our perspective. We're also uh, doing some photogrammetry of this uh, model that we have, offering uh, some people say a ram, some other people say it's a bird. As you can see, it's quite noisy there, the model, it's quite dirty and we need to polish that. Uh, but, you know, a, a second stage would be to add that offer into the, the animation and make it more complete. The whole idea of inserting motion in, in these figurines, in this display, in the context of ancient music, uh, propelled the research of ancient Greek dance at the Your Museum and in the Department of uh, Classics at the University of Reading. So we came up with a research web page, and you can see here when it says other projects that, you know, we've got this Cypriot figurines. And um, this was very well received and because of that uh, we got a, a grant, we were awarded a grant by the Institute of Classical Studies and we were able to host a one-day event for families from you know a, a broad audience and this was just after the pandemic. So over the pandemic we used all the 3D models online on Sketchfab uh, because as you could imagine the museum was closed and the whole touchy-feely of 3D printed replicas was, you know, uh, out of question. But after the pandemic that we were able to open up the museum, uh, we hosted this event, it was very well received, and we got to hire a dance practitioner um, who was a specialist in reconstruction of ancient Greek dances. So she brought her own students, and with them and all together we joined in, you know, um, conveying different ideas of motion that you could see, on, you know, on our collection. And um, it was a great event, very successful. And it was so successful that we hosted another event. Again, it was um, funded by the ICS. And in this case, uh, we hosted a, a series of conferences. We go to uh, really interesting keynote speakers, Frederick Narebud and Dr. Angela Belia. And, uh, you know, together with the curator of the museum, Amy C. Smith and, um, and James Lloyd, uh, the three of us hosted this series of conferences. And again, we were striving and we were putting the you know the importance of motion of the kinetic element that is no longer there when you study music from the iconographical uh, perspective um last but not least uh it was possible to have uh, an icom uk grant to expand this collaboration and this project with the bank of cyprus cultural foundation uh, especially in their Pierides collection, they've got uh, a great number of antiquities. And as you can see, they also rely on sensorial approaches for their educational program. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, the idea of visualizing, of touching and listening. And um, they were also trying to work with 3D printed replicas. So uh, we are collaborating together to get to a joint project in which all these sensorial aspects are there, are present, and, you know, by using their 3D models and our 3D models can come up with, you know, a new collection, a new joint collection for everyone to use. I have to say that this uh, particular uh, animation with the ring dancers, 
uh, was very welcomed and very well received and I got lots of emails. And one of those emails uh, were from Anna Reeve from the Institute of Classical Studies and she proposed that we could, you know, write jointly a paper for uh, a colloquium on terracotas in motion. And, you know, the whole idea is to explore the, the tension uh, between the, the status of these terracotas as museum objects that should be fixed and preserved and the scope that there is in a museum to convey the idea of motion. Uh, here, these two concepts, you can see that, you know, they are displayed even like a natural science uh, collection, you know, frontally isolated one from the other without any context except for the photograph at the background there in the case of the Glyptotech um, of the Ayerina wine. Um, so, for example, one of the uh, suggestions was to, you know, include uh, inside the case like a turning table or a lazy Susan. So, you know, the figurines could be uh, rotated inside the cases, but perhaps that's a bit of a dangerous approach for the fragility of the objects. And, you know, including a QR with, a, with those animations I've just shown you uh, could be another, uh, another option. Um, so the next steps for us is to make all our online data fair, meaning findable, well-planned, carefully collected and analysed, to have it accessible, well presented for our audience and easy to share. And if it's easy to share, it means it's interoperable and reusable. And that's very important specifically because of the whole issue of the uh, obsolescence of, of, of technology. You know, the the 3D scanner that we first use is already obsolete. The first 3D photogrammetry software we first use uh, is already out of the market. So you need to be up, you know, you need to be fast and keep all your information updated so it can be reused for you and other colleagues. Also, the next steps include to add music to the animations and add the background to the animation to provide an archaeological context. Uh, hopefully to include these uh, animations into display spaces using QR codes and also the 3D printed replicas by the cases. Hopefully this will continue to promote collaboration with our other institutions and, you know, enable us to uh, continue researching the collection. Thank you very much for your attention. A question or two? I have one. Uh, okay. Uh, I understand that you work for a museum and that outreach is very important. As a classical scholar, I feel a little weird about creating an object that didn't actually exist in antiquity. Well, it did exist, it's just that we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> we are just copying other models I'll accept and that. Uh, we, we don't want to confuse our visitors, we don't want them to think that you know, they are genuine objects, right. Right. Uh, they know the whole process, they know the whole program, they, they know we are you know, experimenting with them, but you know, from this experimentation what we want to convey is the importance of music and dancing in antiquity. Thank you for bringing the multi-sensorial approach to the fore. And in fact, as much in response to John's question as um, a token of, of uh, appreciation for what you're doing, um, you mentioned the, the ephemeral, you know, what doesn't survive. And in terms of the quality of the science, you know, what you're doing is framed uh, as as much of what I do as outreach. But I sense from what you've presented that in fact there is latent a value for scientific discourse in bringing motion, the things that are evanescent, into um, a, enabling us to play, you use the words to, to, to be free, to, to be able to relax, uh, playing with these things that we, not, we are not able to do without such 
um, dangerous excursions. Yeah, I think that's the, the whole point of 3D printed replicas. It takes away the, you know, the fear of dropping them. And, uh, and also it gives you the, the notion that they could be toys. These terracottas, and I'm not just saying the ones that we have at the Yule Museum, I'm saying all terracottas or cypher terracottas or Greek offerings, uh, they could have been toys, they could have been amulets, they could have had so many lives. They could have been reused and repurposed so many times. Um, so the, when you see people interacting with them, and you know, especially because they are hand-sized, they are hand-sized. So you know, it gives you that the idea that they were moved from one place to the other, that they were played with, that they were deposited, that they were, you know, used in so many ways. And it's just by experimenting that you have that idea. Uh, saying that. Uh, it's, you know, also very interesting how uh, scholars like Fourier or Avare, that they are the ones who are uh, promoting the study of, of terracottas of cyber origin, uh, they are also saying that, you know, sanctuaries were very dynamic. They were open air courts with just, um, you know, an altar and lots of vegetation and people would come around and move around and bring the figurines and deposit them and, you know, move them from one place to the other. So motion was there. It's just that we can't see it now. Well, I, we need to move on to the next speaker. Claudina, thank you so much. It was fascinating. And uh, thank you, I, everyone. I have grandchildren. I want to buy those little figurines. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk late. <laughs> Thank you again. And then finally for this session, hi Tim. Hey, are, are you up? We've been up for hours. I'm here, yeah. <laughs> We're both here. <laughs> okay. Um, Jennifer McLish and Timothy Moore from uh, uh, Florida State University and Washington University in St. Louis are going to talk towards, uh, about, towards a database of Greek dramatic meters. Have at it. Thank you. I'm, I'm so pleased to be back here with folks in Moisa, and I hope to be there in person soon. Uh, and uh, please bear with us if we have some technical challenges. We're going back and forth here, some on Zoom. Uh, but let me share my screen, and then you'll let me know if everything's doing what it's supposed to do. How's that look? Perfect. Let me begin by giving credit where credit is due. In the project we will describe today, I brought a majority of the questions, but whatever answers have been provided have come from others. Most notably, the staff of Washington University and St. Louis's Humanities Digital Workshop, Douglas Knox and Stephen Pentecost, and my co-author, Jennifer McClish, much of the text of today's talk is adapted from a piece Jennifer and I wrote on an earlier version of our database, which has appeared in Futuro Classico. The overall design of the database is primarily the work of McClish and Washington University PhD D. Wong, aided by Pentecost and Knox. The statistics and filter functions you will see are Pentecost's adaptation of McClish's design. Further assisting in the project have been numerous other graduate and undergraduate students of Washington University, as well as one local high school student. And several colleagues of Washington University and elsewhere have offered valuable help and advice. Special thanks go to Anna Kultzer, whose help has been invaluable. Since the creation of online databases of classical texts, such as Perseus and the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae, Various projects have sought to expand such databases to include metrical information. Inspired in part by these projects, my colleagues and I at Washington University in St. Louis's Humanities Digital Workshop are working to create an online open access database that we hope ultimately will present and analyze the metrical patterns of most, if not all, of Greek drama. The seed of this project lies in the publication of a 2016 database 
that charts the meters of each verse in the extant plays of Plautus and Terence. That database allows users both to see easily the meters of each verse in Roman comedy, extant Roman comedy, and to compare the use of different meters and types of meter by playwright, play, character, and character type. It soon became clear to us that an expansion of this database to Greek drama would be desirable, but that such an expanded database should have a very different design to increase its usefulness. First, a database moving beyond Roman comedy requires very careful thought regarding sources. Much controversy remains about the scansion of Plautus and Terence, but Cesare Questa's magisterial Titi Machi Plauti Cantica and some other works provided good foundations upon which to build for the Roman comedy database. In the treacherous waters of Greek dramatic lyrics, finding such authorities is more challenging. Second, the Roman comedy database has the line as its only counted unit. As we pondered a database that included Greek drama, it became clear that uncertainties surrounding kilometry would make any statistics based solely on lines exceedingly problematic. Ideally, we would want to be able to keep track not only of lines, but also of words and of syllables, the least variable of units. Third, the Roman comedy database includes very little actual text or scansion. We wanted users of our expanded database to be able to see the entire text of the plays with scansion. We therefore decided to proceed as followers, follows. We chose to start with Euripides and with Hecabe, Electra, and Orestes, plays that have some especially interesting musical features. For most of Euripides, an open access text, Gilbert Murray's 1902 to 1909 Oxford classical text, is available online through the Perseus Project. Murray's text is problematic in many ways, and more authoritative texts, such as James Diggle's Oxford classical texts, are still under copyright. A request to Oxford University Press to use Diggle's text as our base was rebuffed. Federico Lorenzo's scansions of Euripides' lyrics, based on Diggle's text, however, are open access, and Professor Lorenzo was happy to have us use them. We decided, therefore, that our best course would be to use Murray's text, as presented by Perseus, as our foundation, but to adjust the text and scansion of lyric passages and anapestic passages to match Diggle's text and Lorenzo's scansion and to follow Diggle's arrangement of lines and his decisions regarding the authenticity and attribution of lines in the remaining parts of the plays. As our first step, therefore, numerous students, assistants, and I have been producing templates of Euripides' metrical patterns in Microsoft Word. For the lyric sections, we started with Diggle's text and added Lorenzo's scansion and his identification of meters, periods, end of line hiatus, and brevis in longo. The anapest we have scanned ourselves by hand. The lyrics and anapests are thus included in their entirety scanned in these templates. The templates do not include full texts of passages in iambic trimeter and trochaic tetrameter, where our database will largely reproduce Murray's text. We do, however, Note in those sections where Diggle brackets lines, whether or not these lines are bracketed in Murray, and where he arranges lines in a different order from Murray or changes attribution. The result is a set of templates for each Euripidean play, like the one shown here for the first 152 verses of Orestes. Ideal, of course, would be a database that records all the possibilities of texts and meter, with a kind of metrical apparatus criticus. At least for the time being, though, we feel that such thoroughness is unattainable. So we thought it best to start with the most authoritative text we could produce. Our belief is that this kind of acknowledged grafting of features of Diggle's text onto the text of Murray both meets the demands of reliability 
and is within the bounds of fair use. We would welcome thoughts from today's audience on this decision. Next step is to create an XML document for each play, combining the templates with Murray's text as presented by Perseus. XML, or extensible markup language, lets us structure and annotate our text in a machine-readable format. XML's tools make it much easier to display and manipulate the text at later stages of our process. The XML document we create for each play thus serves as the backbone for the final website. In order to give you an idea of the kinds of overlapping textual and metrical features we are seeking to capture and how we use XML to do so, I will briefly review an example line from Orestes. The basic principle of our processing strategy is to divide each document into nested blocks of XML tags, subdividing by section, stanza, lines, metro or cola, and words until we have reached the syllable level, marking relevant aspects of the text and meter at each stage. The first step is to break up the play into blocks of text according to section or passage. For example, lines 140 to 207 of Orestes are wrapped in tags indicating that this block of text is the paradox. Within each section, we also mark strophes, antistrophes, and other stanzas wherever those divisions occur. These subsections are then broken down further by wrapping every line with tags that mark the line number. Every line is then broken up into its component metra or cola, with tags indicating the beginning and end of the metron or colon, as well as its name. For our purposes, we are defining a metron slash colon as either a basic metrical unit that is repeated to form verses or a unit of meter named by Lorenzo. All of the preceding divisions, i.e. sections, stanzas, lines, and metra are entered manually. Clearly, manually tagging words and syllables would vastly increase our processing time. Therefore, our strategy for the smaller units of analysis is slightly different. For divisions at the word level, we have created a Python program to search through each metron and colon within the XML document and identify word boundaries marking them with XML's milestone feature. After marking each word, we break the metra and cola into syllables. The program carries out automatic syllable identification using James Tauber's Labifier function, part of the Greek accentuation Python library. We then identify the length of each syllable as short or long using a scansion tool developed by Anna Conser and modified by Stephen Pentecost. Automatic scansion leaves many syllables uncertain and makes occasional errors. So as a final step in the production of XML texts, readers check the length of each syllable by eye. They also note the meter of each line in lyric sections, mark some additional phenomena such as antilabi and complete, incomplete lines, and add some comments. Our first goal is to complete XML documents for each play of Euripides. We plan to make these documents available, open access, online, in the hopes that they will prove useful for others who might wish to develop ways of using these machine-readable texts. In the meantime, we are using the XML document to allow users to see and evaluate metrical patterns. Using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the JavaScript library D3, and JSON files, our team has developed a website that shows text and scansion and includes interactive tools for highlighting, filtering, and counting various metrical features. Here is a page of the website that includes Orestes 140 through 162. The central feature of the site is a text box <clears throat> containing the text of Euripides' play. Here users can scroll through the play, move between sections, and search for a specific line. Users can also view the play as plain texts or with overlying scansion. The grid to the left of the box is both a visualization of the play's overarching structure and a navigational tool. The gray boxes on the left of the grid represent play sections. Clicking on one of these boxes calls up the corresponding section in the text. The colored boxes on the right of the grid represent changes in the dominant meter used within a section. Each color corresponds to a different meter or meter type. The collapsible panels on the right of the text box display metrical information about each line, including the name of its meter, whether the meter is lyric 
or non-lyric, the, the type of meter, and the stanza to which it belongs. In the strophic sections, users can also click on a line to find the line to which it responds. By clicking on the box at the bottom of the right of the screen, users can replace these columns with the relevant section of the translation provided on the Perseus site. In order to enable users to explore the text and metrical data, we have also developed a system for filtering the plays according to the features we earlier encoded in the XML documents. By clicking filters at the top left of the main page, users reach a page where they can pull out only the lines, metra, metra and cola, uh, words or syllables that meet certain user selected criteria. After selecting the units of interest at the top of the page, users can categorize those units according to play, part of the play, character, gender of the character, whether the character is a god or human, free or enslaved, and Greek or non-Greek, as well as according to meter and meter type, and whether the meter is lyric or non-lyric. Filters from different categories can also be combined to perform a more specific search. With three clicks, for example, one can find all of the Docmiacs delivered by Electra in Orestes. We have also created a page that helps users with statistical analyses of metrical phenomena. The statistics page calculates both the total and relative proportion of the text that fits user selected criteria. Quantitative comparisons can be made in terms of lines, syllables, or words using the same categories used in the filter function, characters and their gender, status and ethnicity, meters and meter types, and whether meters are lyric or non-lyric. For example, if users want to make a side-by-side -side comparison of how many syllables each character in the corpus delivers in Docmiacs, they can make that selection in the statistics function. The results of their query are then calculated using JavaScript. We use the Plotly JavaScript library to present the data in the form of a bar graph, pie chart, and table. We feel that we have built a solid foundation for the database we envision. Still, the database is very much a work in progress, and much work remains to be done. First, there are a number of bugs that we continue to address, alas. Second, we are thinking hard about our process. Our database is exceedingly labor intensive. Much of this labor is inevitable, and we are fortunate in having at Washington University in St. Louis, a steady supply of talented graduate and undergraduate students who can enter data and generous internal funding for such student interns. We will also seek external funding as the project continues. Nevertheless, because of the amount of material we hope ultimately to include in the database, we continue to seek ways that more steps in our process can be automated or otherwise made less labor intensive. Third, as with any digital project, we are faced with the reality that computers deal in binary oppositions. We will need to decide as we proceed how within this world of yes and no, we should respond to the countless uncertainties in the text and scansion of ancient drama. We must decide, for example, how to respond to plosives followed by liquids, where the playwrights had license to treat the previous syllable if it included a short vowel as long or short. Because it appears that in most Greek drama, short was the more common length of such syllables, right now we mark all such syllables short when they occur in metrical positions that could be filled by a long or short syllable. We welcome your thoughts on this decision. Finally, there remain many things that the database does not yet do, and we will need to decide how much more we can do and how. For example, we are working on a way for users to find in the filter and statistics functions, not only phenomena such as characters and meters, but specific patterns of long and short syllables and on a way for users of the filter and statistic functions to choose whether to include or exclude versus where the text and or meter is uncertain. We are also figuring out how best to keep track of proper names, which have such an important role in metrical license. We need to decide how to deal with phenomena such as synophea, hiatus, and period markers at the end of lines and with seizure. Furthermore, our database currently does nothing with word accents. As the work of Anna Concer has shown, patterns of these accents reveal much about the musical aims of the playwrights. 
We hope in the future to work with CONCERT to incorporate these. We welcome suggestions on other things the database should do. As we go forward, we will need to balance concerns about the complexity of an already complicated set of XML files against the desire for additional tools. There is then much work to be done, and we will value your suggestions on how we should take our next steps. We hope though, that when completed, our database will be of great use, not only to scholars interested in ancient dramas, meter and music, but also to students at all levels and to performers of the plays. Thank you. Uh, he asked for help. Does anybody have any to offer at the moment? Suggestions? Inspirations? How far along are you in the project? We have three plays basically uh, in the system. Uh, we found once we finished them that we have all sorts of errors. That's our great challenge now with all of these human additions along the way. Mistakes have gotten in and we're now working really hard on our system of proofreading and getting things right. Once we have that, we should be able to publish a play or two and have it there. We're also tweaking with the systems of filters and statistics and some other things along the way. But I hope by the end of the calendar year, we'll have at least one or two plays that people can look at and see and use. Earlier, we heard from uh, Laurent Capron about uh, who's setting up a database for the music e scriptoris Greiki. And um, uh, these coding issues that everybody's having, um, I, I think we need to, to uh, either give a, a rousing applause or a moment of silence for the medieval scribes who, <laughs> who didn't even know the language in some cases and did not so, so bad in producing the manuscripts that you know, we've, all, we've all depended upon. Um, I would second that. <laughs> uh, does it take long to bring your assistants up to speed for the, the encoding? It's, it is surprisingly fast. Uh, we have a digital humanities workshop every summer, um, and we try to keep people from year to year to get some transition, but we always have new people coming in. And within a week, they're contributing to the project. It's really quite impressive. Thank you very much, Tim. And Thank you. And, 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 and.